Uh, so we are, uh, we're well into our keynote time this morning. We have uh, one main session left that uh, is, is really a power-packed panel from our headline sponsors. And you know that we are all about the users here. So this panel is going to be moderated by um, a user who has spoken at previous summits. And uh, you know, it's going to be really, I think, getting some good information out of these panelists that is relevant to all of us who are interested in how we take the most advantage of OpenStack and how we work with partners and the community overall to do that. So I am really excited to uh, welcome our moderator from Comcast, Mark Meal. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. It's great to be here. How's everybody doing? Good. All right, we're on the tail end of our keynote session today, so let's uh, not keep you all waiting. Although I was tempted to take a quick jaunt off in that uh, BMW. I got to go talk to Stefan about that a little bit later. That's a pretty sweet car. We got to look at it backstage. You definitely want to take a few minutes and check this puppy out. So let me introduce some of our panelists today. Um, our first person hails from Dublin, Ireland. He's got a huge, well-known passion for open source. He's contributed to a variety of projects over the years, and he's well known to our OpenStack community. He's been the PTL for Oslo. He's been a member of the technical committee and an individual director on the board. Please welcome Mark McLaughlin, the OpenStack technical director at Red Hat. Welcome. OK. Our second panelist has uh, uh, got a tremendous wealth of experience. He started out at SGI doing interactive television, which is near and dear to my heart, kind of before its time. He was working at startups before startups were cool. He was employee number five at Vitria Technology. He was a founding member of the VMware team that did the vCenter product. Everybody's probably familiar with that. And today, he's the CTO of cloud computing at Huawei. Please welcome Haiying Wang. Welcome. Next, we have a person who's held a variety of technology R&D roles, big thinker. He uh, led Ericsson's strategy shift to the cloud, including selecting OpenStack as Ericsson's cloud platform. Uh, and he's done a number of open source projects at Ericsson as well. Today, he's in the CTO office as the vice president of networking and implementation architecture. Let's welcome Matt Carlson, please. <clears throat> OK, and our final panelist uh, joined Intel in 1991, and she's held a variety of roles there. Started out in the systems engineering group, did some pretty cool stuff with factory automation apps. Maybe we'll see if we can explore that a little bit on the panel, or you can talk to her afterwards. And now she's back in a systems engineering role, uh, where she's responsible for building, deploying, and running their hybrid cloud for, um, for Intel IT. Please welcome Intel IT's product owner for hybrid cloud, Ruchi Bargav. There we go. Welcome. All right, gang, here we go. So I thought we'd start with uh, a pretty reasonable introductory question. We won't get to the hard stuff until later. But you know, why is OpenStack important to you and your companies? Mark, maybe you can start us off. Yep, sure. Um, well, I guess from Red Hat's perspective, you know, Fundamentally, we're trying to be you know, a full-spectrum provider of solutions for the cloud data center. And you know, obviously, OpenStack is a, a key technology part of that. But I think what really excites us about OpenStack is just you know, this amazing, diverse, um, vibrant open source project we've built here. And you know, we're a pure play open source company. And we kind of, this is the exact environment that we know great stuff is going to happen here. And we know how to bring that value to our, our customers through our products and our, our partner ecosystem. For me, at a very personal level, I mean, like I've been working on OpenStack for our open source for something like 15 years. And I guess I've set my mind to trying to figure out how to prove that open source is the ideal way for cross industry collaboration on technology. And I think you know, OpenStack is just the, the really ideal example of that, of that happening. So I'm really the realization. Yeah. Excited Hi, to be part of it. Hi, Ying, how about you? Oh, uh, yeah. I, I think uh, um, Huawei is a big telco company, we benefited from the standard. I think for new technology to get adoption, open and then standard system is crucial. So I think OpenStack playing that role, uh, from our perspective, we, for foremost, we want to make OpenStack to be successful, to become a standard. 
for more uh, wider adoptions. So that's why we have a dedicated team um, contributing on the OpenStack. Yeah. Great, thanks. Matt, would you like to take a shot? I mean, continue on the, I think, the open API, that you have something that can drive industry alignment, uh, the open source models as such, driving innovation and speed. I think a third aspect that we really see important is that OpenStack is actually the only one that provides a true multi-vendor orchestration engine, so say, because you can actually add whatever third-party software, whatever third-party services, or whatever third-party equipment that you want. So, and I think that is pretty unique. That, you, that It's a pluggable architecture. I think that has been important for us. That's fantastic coming from a vendor that uh, you know, might want to sell every component or might want to be able to play in every component, allowing us to plug in different pieces. As a user, that seems like it's pretty... You know, that's one of my goals, anyway. Ruchi, how about you? Why are you uh, excited about OpenStack? So uh, Intel, as you saw in the video before in the presentation, that is driving the vision of a software-defined infrastructure and redefining the data center. And with that, uh, it's very important to have a co single control plane as the orchestration layer and nothing better than OpenStack to drive that. So I think that's where Intel is really vested in this. Awesome. That sounds like a great vision, but you and I are users. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about some of the pain points that, that we feel at Comcast and at Intel IT um, around OpenStack and, and what we need to do as a community to make it better. What are the pain points? You know, I'll talk about the pain points and like, I, I see three key pain points. And I think a lot of folks here from the enterprise world will relate to that. One is to have rolling upgrades. You don't want to, uh, you want to upgrade from how many of you are probably still on Havana and maybe some on Grizzly. Uh, you want to do upgrades without bringing downtime to the tenants. So that's one. And then enterprise shops have a lot of investments of, uh, in infrastructure. So how do we integrate the legacy uh, existing infrastructure investments into OpenStack? That's another key, uh, very important area, where is, which is a big pain point for me. And the third part is, you know, as a hybrid cloud product owner, to do a federated identity uh, authentication with a public cloud. That's, again, a, a, you know, a big pain point. Uh, we have done POCs, but still something to grow on. Awesome. You know, stability and scalability, key, key themes, I think, for probably both of our companies. Uh, there has been this, this emphasis on features. So OpenStack has been running forward, 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 adding new features as we go. I wonder if we could you know, solicit some thoughts from some of the supplier side of our panel around what we can do to increase stability and scalability around the OpenStack infrastructure. I can maybe start. Yes. Um, now I think, uh, I mean, talking to a number of operators, a lot of them are kind of stuck on Havana because they can't do yep. an upgrade. So I think just getting upgrades, getting automatic backup and restore and all these things in, into place, I think it, it's, it's a key because when we are starting deploying these telecom workloads, this is uh, services that requires five nines of availability and uh, including planned downtime. We need to have, this, for instance, rolling upgrades so say, in place because mm -hmm. we can't afford so say, to, to t take down the system. How about, uh, let's talk about installation and deployments. I think, Haiying, you had some thoughts that you wanted to share on that when we were prepping. Yes, I think uh, uh, as OpenStack getting mature, we still have lots of to do. People starting to adopt, I think the challenge for them that uh, this kind of software defining infrastructure, move the function from hardware to software, make it more dynamic, but at the same time make it very hard for user to adopt. So we see more effort on standing up the open stack, but that's just the first step. If the, uh, the uh, software defining infrastructure without uh, uh, right, run operatorly uh, correctly and updated correctly, it will become obsolete or uh, often hardware very quickly. So the Installation and uh, running the infrastructure and uh, keep them updated as the software is itself is a moving target. So I think the next wave is the tools to help people to adopt OpenStack, to run OpenStack, to keep them updated as the software itself moves forward. Mark, what have you been hearing from, from customers? Sure. I mean, many of the, the pain points um, we hear from customers are similar to what Rishi talked about there in terms of upgradability and scalability and performance, operability, installation, deployment, ongoing management. It's all, you know, it's, it's all key parts of, of what's needed here. And I think, um, you know, I think we are in the early days of OpenStack and, you know, pain points like this is not something we should be um, afraid of talking about. It's just part, we're all here together in the sausage factory. Mm -hmm. all publicly and we're, we're all um, you know, keen to make it work. You talked a little bit there about features versus um, you know, 
working on the, the core aspects that we talked about there. And you know, I, I celebrate both, right? The, the community is growing here. It's a diverse set of interests. Some people want to work on kind of expanding the scope of OpenStack and adding new features and uh, competing with um, some of the other cloud providers out there. But there's still a, a very strong core group of people on the project wanting to, to improve the core. Hey, let's talk a little bit more about some of the stuff around the core. So it's not uncommon when you build software that you sort of get the core features right, as you were saying, and then you start to sort of flesh it out. Um, as an operator, one of the things that stresses me out a little bit is that a lot of the tooling around the infrastructure is, is later to market, so to speak, uh, you know, running it in, in an automated way or sort of automating this piece of the puzzle versus just kind of doing things manually. The monitoring tools, the accounting tools, things like, you know, Solometer and so on. Uh, any thoughts about um, what the next sort of wave of priorities need to be and how far along we are um, getting the, the, the supporting infrastructure working? Somebody's got to jump in. We can't sit here for 20 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think I just uh, follow what I just said. I think uh, the tools that help people adopt OpenStack is crucial because the traditional IT tool is you no know, use in this environment. So we, uh, I think I already see the effort. Lots of startup and lots of an open source project in working on this area to ad address the pain point for the end users. So you can. Uh, around the systems you can stand up and keep them updated. You have a punch list you want everybody? We've got, the, we've got like the, half the development community here. Yeah, well, I say many open source projects and the triple and others, and uh, you know, Huawei have one called a Compass, addressing the standing up, operate, and, uh, and uh, I, think, uh, I think we need more feedback from user to drive the adoptions. Perfect. So, you know, uh, we at Intel have uh, enterprise use case, and then we also have, I guess, in the industry, the HPC use case, where you could have 10,000 servers, and you want to deploy code and on all of them within minutes. Today, with Python, uh, you know, uh, I think it's going to be a challenge because it's interpreted. And uh, so, uh, from what I have heard by some of my, from some of my engineers, that uh, Facebook does. Uh, I, I don't remember what the uh, technology is. Basically, it's compiled Python kind of uh, stuff. So maybe that's something which our community could mm -hmm. go address. Right, so there are high-scale use cases mm -hmm. that even though this is a highly scalable architecture, it doesn't, we don't quite address them well. Right. 10,000 VMs at one time seems like a big task to me. We don't have that kind of use case at Comcast, but... But Intel in the HPC, HPC world, mm -hmm. not only at Intel, but uh, across the globe. Yeah, we should get the CERN guys back out here, ask, <laughs> them, ask them if they've got any tricks up their sleeves. Good. Let's, let's talk a little bit about NFV. You know, there are, there are always these, um, uh, you know, Jonathan put up the buzzword bingo uh, sheet. I'm not sure if NFV was actually on, on the list there. But it is one of the things that uh, seems to be on this parallel track to all of our work here in OpenStack. And as a user, you know, I kind of wonder, are, are these things destined to be parallel forever, or do we need to bring them together? Go ahead, Matt. Uh, well, I think uh, NFV is actually, as I said, about virtualizing applications and uh, a network within the operator's network domain. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's probably one of the biggest transformation for, for years now, because we believe that within a couple of years, maybe more than 50% of, of the applications on the network will be virtualized. Uh, when I look on, on, on the demands, I think a lot of the demands are really the same as the demands that we will see for enterprises or high-end enterprises. That is audit, logging, troubleshooting, all this. Maybe the only thing that sticks out is maybe that, uh, that we need to orchestrate the wide area network. We need to have line rates to the, the virtual machines, etc. cetera. But, but I, I think, actually, I think NFV, to a large degree, will most likely drive the same type of requirements that we will see for enterprises. Um, so I, I have big hope that the kind of world can com make combined forces in making this happen. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, I wrote a, a blog post on uh, kind of my NFV journey there recently, and it started for me in Dublin about a year ago when I visited a local uh, partner company there, and they mentioned NFV, and I, I'd never heard of it, so they, they explained it in terms of the you know, the, the application requirements for these really highly specialized applications in, in FE. And my instinct was, no, OpenStack, that's not 
you know, open stack's never going to satisfy that. But I think I've learned over the year that this isn't just taking these existing applications and trying to make them work in a, in a cloud. It's actually the telco market embracing the notion of an elastic cloud. But the applications do have some very uh, specific requirements, say, around deterministic performance and networking requirements. And actually, what we're seeing evolving now is you know, really interesting ways that they can fit in behind the OpenStack abstraction and, and make total sense for OpenStack to support. And so it's, I, I think it's really exciting to see a, you know, a huge market like the telco market about to be transformed by OpenStack and open source. You know, as a buyer of a lot of those um, services, one of the questions that I kind of wrestle with a little bit is, there are some companies that have well-established big iron, you know, routing infrastructure, switching technology, and so on. And they start from a different point than sort of the upstart startup who is building new software from scratch. I wonder if you guys have any thoughts about sort of a, approaching NFV from the point of view of a, a well-established network infrastructure company versus starting from a startup and being able to build software that's meant to be virtualized, meant to, meant to run sort of in a distributed fashion. So yeah, I think uh, you, you mentioned that, that whether they're parallel. I think when they started two years ago, it does seem parallel because uh, OpenStack is more a bottom-up approach and uh, engineer-driven and modular, and uh, NFV is more top-down. And uh, but I think now they're getting closer. Oh, uh, OpenStack society more pushing, uh, more try to meet in the middle, provide functions. They have a subcommittee for. NFV in OpenStack. At the same time, the NFV society is also more realistic to choose not specific platform, but the current platform, but uh, uh, using upstream contribution to figure out what they need. So in the, in the between, I think the challenge here is that uh, when you move the functions from box to software, it gives you dynamics. You take advantage of electric, 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 um, scale, scale up and scale down and the commodity hardware, but at the same time, you lose some control for deterministic computing and SRA. So I think this area that are being pushed. For startup, they may just scratch from a new application, fitting a, uh, a cloud platform. But for exception one, they have already have apps. You try to fit in the current uh, new infrastructures. So this is a challenge that a little bit different, but I think it's getting closer. I'm well, I think it's very promising that maybe next year they will see them more working closely together. Yeah. Matt, you have um, well-established vertically integrated systems at Ericsson that you guys have been selling to a variety of uh, customers for, for many years. What, what, how do you guys think about NFV and the move to software? Are you starting from uh, you know, sort of your foundations and what you've got, or in some cases, are you starting fresh? Uh, I mean, we used to, as I said, we used to, or we, had, we are still delivering boxes with like mm -hmm. these five nines, five nines of availability, as we say, on the service level. I mean, everyone expects that the phone works whatever you are traveling the world, that you should pick it up and it has a phone, and it works. Uh, and of course, the characteristics will not be less when we're going into cloud. So we actually see this as a, as a big opportunity to really kind of speed up service creating of new services, speed up deployment and rollout of new services, because if we don't have to ship in the box, we just have to kind of put the application there. I mean, I think there is a lot of benefits going this journey in terms of speed in, in creating new service, speed in deployment, which can't be done with a kind of box-centric approach that has been the history of telecom. What does a community like the OpenStack community need to do to make it easier for uh, a company like Ericsson or Huawei to um, to, to embrace uh, the, the model that you just described, where uh, we have this rapid iteration happening in the OpenStack community, um, but we're trying to build very stable, very reliable uh, lifeline services in many cases on top, of the, on top of that infrastructure. What does the community need to do to make that um, easy and palatable for a company like Ericsson or Huawei? I think in OpenStack, I already see the sign. It's more coordinated effort, because before it's more each module is sort of independent. So they, uh, and the telco usually it's a whole spectrum standard. The application, uh, the OpenStack right now focus more uh, private enterprise cloud. But uh, the telco is sort of between enterprise and the consumer, so big apps. So cross data center coordinations, those are the futures. If Neutron, uh, Nova, all this group can work together 
and then uh, and at the same time NPN free or those guys can more closer so we can, we can see uh, this can be better fit quickly right? so I think it's getting closer it's got there but if you asking ask us more I think we want OpenStack to be stand up to more coordinated focus on some of the realistic requirement from uh, NF free side mm -hmm. uh, maybe I can add on uh, to create this open energy which is, is a kind of uh, collection of uh, operators and, and vendors in in, um, in creating an NFV, a ref actually a working reference platform, which I think is a good step to say that you actually the target is to have a working reference platform. But I, but I think uh, going into what Ha Ying said, what I actually think is that we can actually try to to bridge the requirements, so say, the things that needs to be done in a synchronous ways over the life cycle, so say roadmaps over maybe a number of. OpenStack releases. I think that I think we can help out with it within in uh, groups like Open NFV, so say, to help out uh, the community and the foundation to to have a more so say, to drive the NFV requirements in a bit more structured way instead of per product. So let's talk a little bit about that tipping point, if we can, and maybe Mark, you can lead us off on this. Have we hit a point where? Um, the way we do this development and the way we sort of manage the product, so to speak, have we hit a tipping point where stability and scalability issues need to be addressed and maybe bumped up in priority relative to the to the feature, feature, feature priority that we've been been marching down? Yeah, I mean, in in terms of those cases, I think what the the developer community. Um, which I guess where I've come from, what, what they're starving from is real kind of concrete feedback from, from operators and use, users. And so we need to you know, figure out how to build a closer feedback loops between the developer community and, and the operator and user community. And kind of similar to your previous question there, it's, it's not so much what should the community do for users or operators or what should the, user or the community do for, for NFE vendors, but more how can uh, the operators and, and, and vendors feel like they're more part of the community and contribute in in different ways to the, the project other than just code. So typically in open source projects, it's very difficult for anyone to figure out how to contribute something other than code. And I think in the case of NFV and in the case of the Windows Enterprise Working Group, we're finding ways that product managers and people with kind of a, a, an understanding of the requirements can come to together, collaborate, and really provide very useful and concrete um, feedback and input to the developer community to feed off. And so that's a really exciting development, I think, within, within the project right now. Pretty good. So, uh, you know, uh, something which Jonathan said in his keynote really resonated with me and what uh, Mark, you talked about is uh, the software-defined economy, you know, and that's really going to drive this because we, uh, in order to do things really fast, fast, and fast, uh, you want to take the IT group out of the picture, and that's where NFV would, uh, you know, where you have the proprietary stacks of hardware, and you can, uh, you know, uh, do NF, uh, orchestrate it with the software layer, that would be really cool. I should mention that we are taking uh, some questions from Twitter. I don't know if we were able to get something up on the screen, but uh, if you tweet with the hashtag OpenStack panel, there are some folks in the back that'll pop up some questions um, onto the, onto the downscreen monitors, downstage monitors for us. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the Intel IT cloud, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, how do you decide between splitting a workload or a project between your private instances and some public instance? Okay, so we don't have a production hybrid cloud going, but we do have public cloud usage as well as private cloud usage. Mm -hmm. uh, initially, it was the power of the credit card, as we heard earlier. <laughs> so people just went because IT was bureaucratic. We had our own stringent requirements, so they just went for ease of use. But we have you know, put a collective thoughts together and uh, put systems in place so that they only go to public cloud because we've already got a huge amount of investments in our data centers and we don't want to waste those. So uh, we, as, soon, as long as we offer the capability and we have the location available, we prefer that they stay in-house. When we don't have the capability, yes, you know, public cloud is the option. And what we are trying to get with the hybrid cloud solution is you know, it's become seamless to the customer, to our end users, that uh, they get what they need irrespective of where it's residing. What kind of conversations do the rest of you have with your customers as you talk to them about private versus public cloud options? 
Yeah, I mean, I guess at Red Hat we've been talking for years about, about the open hybrid cloud and, and kind of our, our vision for that there. And I think there's still huge opportunities there. And I'm particularly excited around OpenStack, the opportunities around an open hybrid cloud that's actually built on the same kind of under, underlying technologies. So we can expect plenty of, of OpenStack-based public clouds and plenty of, of private clouds. And I think that gives a real, um, you know, a really strong basis for, for making this hybrid, proud, hybrid cloud use case real and really kind of experimenting with all the different ways that you can, you can use that, whether it's you know, spillover into the public cloud, whether it's kind of doing your dev test in the public cloud, but running production in the private cloud, whether it's um, you know, if you've got kind of large scale Hadoop clusters you want to run for a short period of time, you, you have the choice of whether Very to run indeed. that in-house or, or on the public cloud. Good. Yeah, I think the, it is obvious that cloud will be the big part of a future infrastructures. But I think that at the same time, the enterprise always exists. So public or private cloud will be always exist at the same time. The bridge them is nature. So on demand, those futures hypercard can realize for the enterprise. But at the same time, for the governance and security, the private cloud can satisfy the uh, company need. So I think OpenStack bring a uh, great opportunity for that. And they, 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 they try to uh, mirror the success of public cloud in the form that most enterprises can consume. So uh, like Amazon, you can compatible with uh, OpenStack, and then now some people are even doing uh, Microsoft and, uh, and, uh, and Google. I think, so this is inevitable, and there's lots of challenges, because both sides are a moving target. So synchronize them, and it will be challenging. I think Intel doing a good job. As we have some customers. They're also trying to bridge them all. But they basically use OpenStack as a general platform to con uh, API to connect them all together. So at least from management perspective, operation perspective, it's one interface for both sides. Although behind the scenes, they are still a bit different as time goes, and you actually will be more consistent. So I think a prior cloud will be the future for them. Great. So let's, uh, let's jump in maybe into our last topic. We've got about eight or nine minutes left. Let's talk about talent. Um, I'm a big user of OpenStack. I need to hire people in order to help me figure out how to build it, what to build, where to build it, how to operate it, keep up with all the releases, and so on. Um, you know, there was, a, there was a great happy hour last night for the women of OpenStack. Wow. Um, I think you got the opportunity yes. to be there. You want to tell us a little bit about it? Sure. So uh, there was uh, the two events being held at the summit. One was a happy hour for women of OpenStack hosted by IBM, I think a great uh, event. Uh, I believe they've been doing it since the San Diego summit, and hopefully they will continue doing it, or somebody else will. Uh, and uh, it uh, brings to the point of uh, you know, bringing diversity to not only our developers, to our users, to all aspects of the community. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's true for any business. The more diversity you have, uh, the better it is. And uh, from a talent perspective, uh, as you all know, 50% uh, men and women graduate out of college. So if we uh, don't have, uh, we don't target that segment of the student graduates, uh, we are going to be missing the boat. So I think as a community, we really need to focus on that. However, if you want me to talk about general talent development? Well, let me just comment on something that you made me th uh, think of here. So it, isn't it interesting that one of the strengths of open source in general is the diversity of all the use cases, the developers, the perspectives that come to an open source environment. And here we are in the OpenStack community really trying to drive diversity into the development community. And there is, I think, one, it's no secret that there's sort of one area that we always seem to fall a bit short in, and that's having women inside the technology organizations in general and specifically inside OpenStack. I think it is fantastic, and I applaud IBM for hosting the Women of OpenStack event last night. So why don't we make it a little bit more uh, generic and talk a little bit about uh, generic talent for OpenStack. And that's, again, uh, I'm sure all of you, from whichever group you are in, whichever company you are in, you find it extremely hard to find developers, uh, deployers of OpenStack. And what we, at, at least at Intel, have started doing is tapping into the talent early. Uh, starting from high school, we've st uh, we plan to host uh, hackathons where we'll get high school kids to go fix bugs, try to teach them. And we heard about the Linux student there. Yeah. I think we are trying to get... Uh, we'll have know. to get under seventh grade somehow. That's yeah. the new bar. Yeah. <laughs> now, well, that's something new which I learned. So that's mm -hmm. maybe going there is next. And then uh, globally, wherever we have teams, development 
teams at Intel. We have partnered with the universities. And in Poland, we've got a grant to go with the, and work with the university to develop OpenStack talent. In Guadalajara, we work with the university and besides the US universities. So, so you really think of it as a pipeline that you have to start very early in the talent you know, selection or, or talent development process, and you're starting it all the way back in high school. Absolutely, and it's, you know, if we go back to the Linux days, uh, you know, I think we have to learn a lot from them, and we, we went through the same path. We got a huge community there, and OpenStack needs to just follow that path, in my mind. So once we get this great pipeline going, we've got people that are sort of flowing out the end of this river into the OpenStack community, what do we need to do to mentor them as developers in the OpenStack community? Uh, yeah, I mean, one example of what's going on is just over this weekend, the OpenStack Foundation organized um, a, a training, upstream training session, I think, and they had over 60 new developers join that. And, and be, yeah, the, the foundation and the, the, um, the volunteers there mentored these new developers and showed them the processes. Um, I mean, at Red Hat, we're, I guess, used to trying to, to grow new talent and, and find people who have a real passion for open source and um, you know, really understand the collaborative environment that, that's needed here. And uh, it's really an inexact science. And I've yet to understand how to, to predict whether a really strong developer is going to be successful in, in a, an environment like this. So I, I think it's really for you know, anyone getting involved with the project. It's just a question of give, giving it a shot. Don't be, don't be shy. Just step up, get to know people, see where you can kind of find your niche and, and contribute, and see what happens. It's, it's really good fun if you can kind of figure out how to, how to play in this environment. No, and I think it's also give uh, new designers a lot of spare time and just tell them that you, you, are, you can sit down and review OpenStack code for uh, and participate in re reviews, because I think that is often the best way in. And uh, just give them the time so they get acquainted to the process, et cetera. Give them the opportunity. Yeah, and, and I mean, I mean you, you have to spend a couple of months, I'd say, to <laughs> train it, and that is probably the investment you have to take in a lot of cases. Well, maybe that's one of the challenges. There's so much to learn that it does, there is a long spin-up time. You know, one of the things we measure at Comcast is how long does it take a new developer to sort of get productive. And it might be that it's long um, for a new developer to get productive on a, on a piece of OpenStack. What other challenges have you guys encountered uh, as you've tried to bring development resources into the OpenStack ecosystem? So uh, I think uh, uh, Huawei's uh, OpenStack journey is very compelling. And we, OpenStack really is an international movement. So you need to get all people to get involved. But we do have unique challenges, like many other people, companies here. Uh, we have language challenges, English predominant. So if you're not English, you have some challenge over there. And uh, there's a culture clash because it's more open discussion. And um, for Asia countries, it's less fam comfortable for the style. But it, as we go, and I think community is very welcome. Uh, so as we go, we overcome all those. And it, I remember the first team member checking the code from China would take a couple of months because there's lots of things that go through. But after you build a confidence, you have a core team, you build on a success, you give people have a choice for freedom, freedom of choice, so they can do whatever they feel comfortable, it will come along. So uh, as we are, and we think in two years, we contribution dramatically increase. I think that's a tale story. I think I hope more people are involved, really make it a global movement to make this stand more successful quickly. Excellent. All right, well, with that, I'll just say thank you very much for uh, participating in the panel. Can we give our panelists a round of applause, please? I think we're, I think we're going to go back to Jonathan. How was that? Did we do okay? Yes, that was great. Thank you guys very much for uh, for Thanks joining for us. Me. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning, John. One of the things that I actually really appreciate about that panel is uh, all of these people are very involved in OpenStack. You know, these are people that are working in the community and building products and working with customers every day, and that's that's great to see all of the different perspectives that, uh, that we can get here at the OpenStack Summit. 